Coming up on The Watchman, Pastor Jack Hibbs is here with a breakdown of all things Bible prophecy. Plus, we've got an update on the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, and a family member of a hostage held in Gaza joins us for an exclusive interview coming up right here on The Watchman. And welcome to The Watchman. Our good friend, Pastor Jack Hibbs, will be joining us in just a minute. But up first, I wanted to give you a breaking update on the latest out of Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. Now, over the past few weeks here in The Watchman, we've been laying out for you how Shifa Hospital would really become the center of the world's attention as the Israel Defense Forces continue their ground offensive in Gaza City to crush the Hamas death cult once and for all. Now, Shifa Hospital, according to the IDF, has been a command and control center for Hamas over the past several years. IDF soldiers entered the hospital in the past several days and were able to acquire a treasure trove of Hamas weapons that were there, also Hamas uh, intelligence information, planning, etc. But many of the Critics in the so-called international community were wailing and gnashing their teeth and saying, Israel, you said that Hamas has a command and control center underneath Shifa Hospital. Where is it? We don't see the evidence. Well, lo and behold, folks, over the weekend, the IDF, as they continued digging quite literally in and around Shifa Hospital, and they started moving their operation beneath the hospital, they started to find some very interesting uh, tidbits of what Hamas has been doing there. Interesting on one hand, horrifying on the other. I say that because Hamas was holding hostages in the hospital, presumably with the full knowledge of employees, doctors, etc. at the hospital. The IDF revealed over the weekend on surveillance footage captured from the hospital that Hamas held at least two hostages taken in the October 7th massacre in southern Israel, dragged at least two hostages over the border into Gaza, and yes, held them at Shifa Hospital. Not only that, the IDF says that at least one hostage who was an Israeli soldier was murdered by Hamas inside the hospital. So that's Exhibit A on the evidence for all the scoffers and the doubters around the world who were questioning Israel's narrative of what Hamas was really doing at Shifa Hospital. Number two, the IDF, again, lo and behold, surprise, surprise, found a terror tunnel descending deep beneath Al Shifa Hospital. Smoking gun, quite literally, or should I say several smoking guns, uncovered at this hospital. And the IDF now is releasing clips of what they're finding, and we've got one here with a spokesperson for the Israel Defense Forces showing the tunnel beneath Shifa Hospital. Take a look. We're in a military convoy. We're going into Gaza to Shifa Hospital to see the shaft of the terror tunnels that was located there near the Qatari compound. We're in a convoy. We're going to go lights out soon. We're here in the complex of Shifa, we got to the shaft. We're in the middle of the complex. Right in front of me is the Qatari building where the uh, patients are still being treated. And I'm standing at the opening of the shaft. This has been shown to the press. We can't see all the way down, but this is how deep it goes. Cameras lowered down there. It goes down, then turns into a corridor, walks down that corridor, about 200 meters, we see at the end of that corridor a blockaded door that is fireproof that has a shooting hole through it. This is a terrorist tunnel. This is a Hamas infrastructure that has no business being inside a hospital facility. No hospital in the world other than inside Gaza has a terror tunnel shaft within its compound. And we're showing the proof right now. Now, folks, that's Al Shifa Hospital. That's the largest hospital in Gaza City. But that is just one hospital there where Hamas has apparently been operating over the years. There are more, and you can expect that the IDF will also conduct raids 
in other hospitals in Gaza City. Again, the world's going to howl at first, but then when Israel shows the concrete evidence, like you just saw, of Hamas terror activity, sadly, inside of hospitals, then you'll see the world move on to other new criticisms of Israel and something else to pick Israel apart about, although Israel is going to extraordinary lengths to avoid any civilian casualties. The rules of engagement for the Israel Defense Forces are stricter than any other military in the world, and yet the criticism continues, but that is par for the course. We live in times, folks, where good is called evil and evil is called good. Bible times, prophetic times, speaking of which, and speaking, I'm sad to say, of evil, Iran, as we've laid out for you here on The Watchman many times, enforces this ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides. Now, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza are just one ring on that ring of fire. We've also got Hezbollah, of course, in Lebanon. We've got the various Shia militias backed by Iran in Iraq and Syria, and then we have the Houthis in Yemen, about 1,000 miles to the south of Israel, but they've been making a lot of noise over the past several weeks since the Israel-Hamas war broke out. So as we take a quick tour of this ring of fire, just know this, that over the weekend, the Houthis hijacked a ship in the Red Sea. They have declared that they are going to seize any Israeli shipping or Israeli-owned shipping that passes through the Red Sea. Now, Israel says this vessel that was seized by the Houthis over the weekend had no link to Israel whatsoever. Apparently, there were no Israelis or Jews on board, but the Houthis have made very clear their intentions here, folks, and this follows repeated barrages of rockets, missiles, and the launching of attack drones in the direction of Israel by the Houthis over the past several weeks. Now, thankfully, these projectiles have been intercepted uh, by Israel and by the U.S. operating in the Red Sea. But nonetheless, I posed this question recently on The Watchman. I will ask it again. Uh, when does Israel, or does Israel at all, respond to this increased Houthi onslaught and the threats posed out of Yemen? I know Israel doesn't want to open a third front here, but look, the Houthis are definitely up in the, upping the ante, so to speak. And just to give you an idea of what they're all about, in case you had any doubt, here is the slogan of the Houthis, their official platform and what they live by. And I quote, Allah is the greatest, death to America, death to Israel, curse to the Jews, and victory to Islam. Other than that, I'm sure they're perfectly reasonable chaps. But that is what the Houthis are all about. Quick Reminder as well about what's going on on the northern front. Before we get to Pastor Jack, real quick, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said recently that Hezbollah so far has launched over 1,000 projectiles from Lebanon into northern Israel. Folks, that's a stunning number, and I'm sad to say it's probably only going to increase just as we ask about the Houthis. How long can Israel hold off before it takes some sort of action against them? I think the big question is really that northern front, and we know that Hezbollah wields some 150,000 rockets and missiles pointed at every inch of the world's one and only Jewish state, which, helpful reminder, is the size of the state of New Jersey. How long can Israel countenance this, these Hezbollah barrages from the north, taking great pains, to avoid opening a major front to the north, but at the same time having a duty to protect the citizens of northern Israel. A lot of questions to dig into as we move forward into what appears to be a long war. This isn't going to be over quick, folks. It's going to take time, but I believe at the end, Israel is going to decisively crush Hamas and Hezbollah may be next on the list and the Houthis as well. Expect the unexpected. In today's Middle East, the world's most volatile and chaotic region. And that's why we're so glad to have our good friend, Pastor Jack Hibbs, with us to break down this, all of this and to try to make sense of it all. Pastor Jack is senior pastor, founding pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, and host of the great show, Real Life with Jack Hibbs, which you can see right here on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to his channel. Pastor Jack, always great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. Eric, thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey, so much to talk about with you, Pastor Jack, and you've been 
every day since October 7th, since this massacre of the Jewish people in southern Israel. You've been sounding the alarm. You've been uh, sharing prophetic insights. Uh, number one, first and foremost, a lot of people are asking, what does this mean prophetically? Where are we on the prophetic timeline? As the events of October 7th unfolded and in the weeks since, what is your sense of where we're at right now prophetically? And do you consider what happened on October 7th and the ensuing war a major prophetic event? Well, Eric, there's no doubt about it that when something happens in Israel with the Jewish people, we're talking about a post-May 14th, 1948 occurrence or event, which means that this has got the, the uh, attention of heaven, so to speak, right? So nothing can happen in Israel without us having to pause, dive into our scriptures, predominantly the Old Testament, and begin to look at what God has promised with, number one, the rebirth of the nation Israel. We have to remember, it's the rebirth, not the birth of, but the rebirth. So God has brought his people back into their own land, just as he promised in the book of Ezekiel. And so with what's happening right now, Eric, we don't want to be sensationalist, but at the same time, we want to be like the sons of Ishakar, discerning the times that Israel lives in and what it ought to do next. So as, as we look to the Word of God, what can we surmise at this point? We need to be careful, but always be biblical. Are we on the brink of the Ezekiel battle? There are people who describe this and think about it. What about Isaiah chapter 17, which very well, Eric, may be uh, where we're at right now, very, very close to that. And, and Isaiah 17 talks about something happening in Israel, it don't, or excuse me, in Damascus. It, it's, it, it's cryptically says, but with Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49, it says that a fire will begin in the wall of Damascus, Syria, and whatever that entails, it requires an Israeli response. And it says that Damascus will be utterly destroyed. Now, what does that have to do with, with uh, Hezbollah or anything else? Eric, your program and your social media posts have been so spot on as you and I have watched the emanation of this war expand. I am keeping my eyes on Damascus. Something quite possibly could happen any day which will heighten the event, and it could be that which Eric brings in the Ezekiel 38 players. And for those of you who are not aware, read Ezekiel chapter 38, because it's very clear that Russia is the tip of the spear uh, that mentions nations that it will help, and those are Islamic nations, all of them dedicated, by the way, to the anni annihilation of Israel. But, you know, you mentioned third front, Israel, of course, nobody wants to see a third front. But, Eric, you and I know if we were off camera right now, you and I would be talking about a third front, a <laughs> fourth front, because the scriptures tell us in the last days, one of the indicators— of it being the last days is that Israel would be completely surrounded and abandoned by its allies, like the United States. And tragically, we see overtures of our nation now beginning to be a little weak need in its support of Israel. And to me, that's telling. Yeah, I want to ask you about that, Pastor Jack, in a minute. And I'm glad you mentioned Isaiah 17. Look, it says, Damascus, one of the world's oldest inhabited cities, if not the oldest, will become a ruinous heap and it will cease to be a city. Even the Mongols didn't completely destroy Damascus, but the Bible is very clear that day is coming. I wanted to ask you real quick about Russia. You mentioned Ezekiel 38, 39, that coming war of Gog and Magog. And I agree, Pastor Jack. I think we're seeing the groundwork being laid for that right now. Uh, what's been your thoughts on the Russia-Iran relationship, how that's growing? And Russia even hosted a Hamas delegation in Moscow a little over a week after October 7th. Pretty stunning, not stunning if you know Bible prophecy, but pretty stunning to see it all unfold right now in real time with Russia turning, I would say, against Israel pretty openly at this point. Look, Russia and Putin, they want to survive like any other country on earth. And, and, and Putin's ready to throw his relationship with Israel under the bus just for the survival of Russia. You see, Jack, what do you mean by that? Russia needs Persian oil. They've got to have it. It's too expensive for Russia to get oil. Russia is sitting on a lot of oil, but it's so expensive and so deep and not the best quality. They need that uh, Persian oil. However, the book of Ezekiel, tells us that Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, led by Gog, G-O-G, -G, the leader, 
will have a hook put in his jaw and pull down in the area of, of the Middle East uh, into the north of Israel. And uh, Persia, or Iran today, Eric, you well know that Ezekiel says that, that this Russian entity will be a guard unto them. And the word guard in Hebrew means a supplier. Russia is supplying arms, technology. And so we could very easily see uh, an, an increase or an uptick, listen now, an uptick of Russian involvement with Iran at this time as Russia begins to smell victory in Ukraine. The U.S. is backing away from the Ukraine. We're starting to get a little bit uh, worried about that. It may be a lost cause. And Putin is smelling victory. If he claims victory in Ukraine, it's only going to embolden him to now go after or into the Middle East as he has. Here's a key. Could the hook, Eric, be an arms agreement and a protection agreement that Russia has signed with Iran many years ago that Russia will protect Iran against any foreign entities. So again, we see serious stage setting uh, movements being put in place that could very well trigger what you mentioned a moment ago, Damascus going up, that could trigger Ezekiel, or is Ezekiel first? Here's the point, we are so close to something happening. Nobody should take this time lightly. And you're right, Eric, it is going to be a long war. And as it goes on, Israel will become more depleted, but I believe the Jew will begin to turn, at least some early, maybe turn it into a flood. Many Jews will begin to look to Yeshua as Messiah. Yeah, I want to ask you about that as well, Pastor Jack. But you make a great point about Russia and Iran. You have to think that's a quid pro quo relationship, right? Where Iran is supplying Russia with hundreds of thousands of drones and Iran saying, what do we get in return? The mullahs aren't supplying Russia with these advanced armaments out of the goodness of their hearts, needless to say. Hey, you've mentioned the Biden administration and their treatment, I guess you would say, of this war. You've called it, you've called the U.S. in general recently on your podcast schizophrenic, including the Israel policy. And I think rightfully so. What's your take on the U.S.'s posture towards Israel since October 7th and what may be coming in the U.S.-Israel relationship? You could ask yourself, what is the only stable democracy and economy and regional superpower in the area of the Middle East? It is Israel, our, our longtime ally. The United States from the Zionist movement to today was, has been, as it were, like a big brother uh, to Israel. And so you would ask yourself, uh, America always stands with Israel, right? Well, we have, but what's going on now? Yeah, I'm going to stand by the word schizophrenia regarding our policies. We are funding Israel while at the same time funding Iran. That's a sense of schizophrenia. We are telling Israel that they have to defend themselves. At the same time, Eric, we're telling them, you need to cease fire. And you and I know well, we've been to the Middle East countless times, whenever uh, Israel's enemies ask for a ceasefire. It means they're losing and they want to pause so they can rearm. The West doesn't understand that. And I'm, I'm sad to say that this administration does not understand the way the Middle Eastern mind thinks. And yet we've got a friend in the Middle East. And I, I believe that we are currently at least mentally abusing Israel by this bizarre uh, foreign policy, if that's what you want to call it, regarding the Biden administration. Uh, you know, Eric, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but uh, it's a fact. If you look at the eight years of Obama's Middle East policies, skip four years of Trump, that was an anomaly. The last several years under Biden has really been the policies and practices of Obama. And that caused Israel to be insecure, unstable, not knowing what is the U.S. going to do next? They're going to send us some weapons or some money? But then they turn right around and they fund the uh, arms development of Iran. What in the world are we doing as a country? That should concern not only Americans, but the entire world. Yeah, it's an upside down policy. And then some Pastor Jack. Hey, we've got about a minute left. Uh, we can also talk about the spirit of lawlessness in the U.S., in Europe right now. These pro-Hamas rallies, the rise of anti-Semitism. But Thanksgiving is here. It's Thanksgiving week. Uh, any thoughts right now in your heart? I know the events in Israel are foremost in all of our minds right now. Uh, any thoughts on your mind, on your heart right now about where we're at and what we should be thinking about 
on this Thanksgiving? Wonderful. I can tell you this right now. I just announced it to the church yesterday that I said, how many of you are more thankful today than ever before? More hands went up, Eric, than I've ever seen in 33 years of church life. I got to tell you, I'm more thankful. We ought to be more thankful. And I think this is the reason why. Things on the surface seem unstable. The price of everything, living life, the insecurity, the lawlessness causes the believer who trusts in God to say, Lord, I've never been more thankful for the slice of bread I have, but I've never been more thankful for the fact that you keep your promises, God, you're faithful. And here in America, it is our one and only holy day, Thanksgiving Day is a Christian holy day. And, you know, in the life of the believer, it's it's thankfulness every day. With all that's happening, Eric, I've never been more grateful, more thankful to God that he is our strong tower for sure. He is moving. He is moving, Pastor Jack. Amid all the madness, he's still on the throne. And thank you for reminding us of that. Hey, Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. Folks, again, subscribe to Real Life with Jack Hibbs on YouTube. Pastor Jack, thanks so much for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving. God bless. We'll see you again soon. God bless, Eric. Thank you. The one and only Pastor Jack Hibbs, our good friend. Always great to get his prophetic insights, folks. And check him out again, Real Life with Jack Hibbs. Just incredible, timely programming for such a time as this. Well, it is Thanksgiving. I know we've got viewers from all around the world, but here in the United States, as Pastor Jack and I were discussing, Thanksgiving Day is coming up this Thursday. And folks, I am thankful for many, many things, but I do have a bit of a heavy heart as well this Thanksgiving holiday in that the hostages in Gaza are foremost on my mind and on my heart. They have been. If you've been watching The Watchmen and Israel Under Fire over the past several weeks, we have interviewed several families of the hostages here on our programs. And we're joined by another one tonight. His name is Gil Dickman, and he has family members who have been dragged into the bowels of Gaza by Hamas. They were abducted on October 7th, and we continue to lift them up in prayer, folks, every single day. Prayer works. God's arm is not too short. We are praying for a biblical, miraculous hostage rescue in Gaza. That's why we continue uh, to try to keep the hostages and their families foremost on your minds and on your prayer list. This is very, very important, folks. It is the issue of our times, I believe. And Gil Dickman lays out his story, his personal story of October 7th. And this is absolutely for our intercessors. These are prayer points for you to follow up on on Thanksgiving and in the weeks to come. Take a look. My aunt Kineret and my uncle Eshel, they live in Kibbutz Be'eri, and they were having their kids over for Simchat Torah. They were all coming, they were coming from abroad, they had vacations. Carmel, my cousin, was coming from India. Uh, she, had, she was there for a few months. And Alon, my cousin, my other cousin, and his wife, Yarden, and their child, three-year-old child, Geffen, they were coming from uh, South Africa, and they were, they were there celebrating Simchat Torah like every other holiday. But then something strange started to happen, and they noticed uh, my family. The terrorists came in the house around 10 a.m. My uncle, Eshel, was in the bathroom. He was on his way back to the safe room, and his wife, Kineret, was in the kitchen. She was the first that saw the terrorists coming in, and she said, shh, they're coming. And he went back, he went back to the bathroom, he locked the door, he hit there, and he saw through the cracks in the window how they took first his daughter, Carmel, 39 years old. She was walking as they kidnapped her. She looked okay. And that was, he was the last, the last person to see her. We don't know what happened to her ever since. And somewhere during this, during this event, they took his wife, Kineret, 68. After they'd taken Kineret and Carmel, they went and tried to break in the safe room. My cousin, Alon, his wife, Yarden, and the three-year-old daughter, Geffen, were all there. 
Alon understood that the terrorists are trying to come in to break in the safe room. So he took out the light bulb. He covered his wife and his daughter with a blanket. And he came out and said, I'm the only one here, take me. No need to come in. They took him, they tied him up. And then they came in again. They came in the safe room because they wanted to see if there were anyone there. And there was, and then his wife understood that the only way that she could survive and save her daughter was to give herself. And she said, we're here, just take us. And they took them. They took Alon, they took Yarden, his wife, and Geffen. They put him in a car. They put another neighbor that was nearby, put him in the trunk of the car. And they took the car and drove it to Gaza. And it was a few kilometers away. They took the car. And right near the border with the Gaza Strip, they saw a tank, an IDF tank coming in. And the terrorists stopped and ran out of the car. Yarden and Alon took the chance and decided to break free. They managed to break out, to open the doors of the car and run out. Yarden, the mother, was holding Geffen, the three-year-old, in her arms. And she was barefoot and she understood that she couldn't run. So she gave the daughter to Alon and said, run. Alon took Geffen and ran. And he took a last look behind him. He saw his wife hiding behind the tree because they were shooting at them. She hid there. And this was the last time he ever saw her. And this was October 7th for us. And so I ask you, please, please help us in any way you can Bring Carmel and Yarden and the babies and elderly people that are there. More than 200 Israelis are held by Hamas. Please help us bring them back. Folks here on TBN, we will keep them, we'll keep their memory, not their memories, they're still here. We will keep their stories alive, I should say, because much of the world, surprise, surprise, seems to have forgotten since October 7th. And we have much of the world cheerleading for Hamas and taking a vicious stance against Israel. Speaking of which, by the way, when we talk about the world leader and anti-Semitic, anti-Israel activity, you have to talk about the Iranian regime. We talked about them earlier. I should also mention that Iran announced that it just tested a brand new hypersonic missile. Now, hypersonic missiles travel at high speeds, at a low altitude. They are able to evade air defense systems. Iran's claims many times are up for debate, whether it's legitimate or credible. But nonetheless, the Iranian regime, again, is claiming that it just tested a hypersonic missile. And you might be watching all this unfold and think, my word, the sky is falling. This is horrible. Whatever will Israel do? And yet, the Bible is very clear that when it comes to his land and his people, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's still in control. He is still on the throne. Amid all the madness in the world, he is still in control. And Jesus is the rock. When the waves are crashing and the winds are roaring, he is in the boat with you. So build your life. Establish your life on the rock and you will be able to withstand the many storms that are hitting us right now in the United States, around the world and beyond and the storms to come. Eventually, folks, we will move into what the prophet Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble. But to encourage you, not only is God on the throne, but the enemies of God and the enemies of Israel right now, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian regime, they hate ultimately the God of Israel. But the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, is pretty clear about their ultimate fate. God was, was very clear. There were no gray areas. It was very black and white. When God told Abraham, I will curse those who cur bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I don't see uh, the Nazi regime, uh, Haman, the Philistines, Pharaoh, the Assyrian Empire. The list goes on and on. The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, of these empires and individuals that persecuted Israel and the Jewish people. They've all fallen into the ash heap of history, yet Israel, against all odds, again, this tiny nation, the size of the state of New Jersey, continues not only to survive,
but to thrive. Only God could work a miracle such as that. So take heart and be encouraged. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here today on The Watchman. Until tomorrow, God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.